Okay. Welcome everybody to today's Novage webinar. Introducing Rhino CFD Fluid Dynamics Made Simple. This webinar aims to introduce the concept of CFD to novel users, as well as demonstrate how to use the software with practical example, covering urban flow, interior ventilation, flow past ship soles, and forces on sails, and dual recasting. Uh, today's presenter, let me show you, Andrew Carmichael, is an engineer manager at CHAM, in charge of the application department, which deals with consultancy CFD work, as well as novel product development. Um, Andrew has a master's degree in aeronautical engineering from Imperial College London, and is also a chartered engineer through the Royal Aeronautical Society in the UK. And now let me tell you a little bit about Novage. Novage is um, uh, the biggest online design store for all your design software. So this is where you can find um, Rhino CFD and many other products, including mm -hmm. Rhino. And um, I recommend you to join us on Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter to um, check out our latest specials, new releases. It's always very useful to be on top of all the promotions. And uh, our next webinar will be on V-Ray for Cinema 4D. And if you want to rewatch this webinar, you can always go on our YouTube and Vimeo channels and you'll see all our recordings. Just look for Novage. And now I'm gonna pass the screen to Andrew. Let's see if the transition is smooth. And then I'm gonna close my microphone and let him do all the talking. All right, take okay, it away, Andrew. So uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Uh, thanks a lot, Barbara. Uh, welcome to everybody and thanks for joining us in this uh, webinar. Hopefully you'll find it useful. Um, I'm Andrew Carmichael, uh, Engineering Manager at CHAM, and I've got Ryan Dyer with me. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of heads up the way I plan on doing this, um, Ryan's going to be able, around to answer questions throughout the presentation. So if you have any, just fire them away. He'll get right back to you. Um, if he doesn't, for whatever reason, uh, we may save some till the end um, and then answer them then. Uh, I'm just going to give you a, a quick overview of what how I'm going to go through things. I'll give you a brief presentation first uh, of the general concepts and, and the product. Um, after that, we'll look into um, uh, a simple example case of how you set up a simple flow, simple case. And then after that, we'll move into a few of the examples that Barbara mentioned a little bit before. Um, so here we are. Rhino CFD uh, is, well, a CFD product, obviously, but what is CFD? So CFD effectively applies a bunch of complex mathematical equations to fluids and aims to simulate their uh, their effect, both of the fluid itself and its interaction with uh, structures such as buildings, boats, whatever you happen to imagine. Um, what areas of application does it have? Well, it has physical phenomena, so we can do stuff like uh, mass transfer, uh, perspiration, dissolution of different uh, elements, um, phase changes, so we can model melting, freezing, boiling of different um, uh, fluids. Um, chemical reactions, combustion and rusting can also be modeled, and um, mechanical movements such as pistons, fans, rudders, uh, you name it. Um, industries where it's applicable, well, the big ones, obviously, especially for Rhino users, tend to be the built environment, so architects, MEPs. Um, uh, the marine industry, obviously, is a huge uh, industry for us as well. But many other ones, such as jewelry, um, oddly enough, you have filling of molds, which is a, a liquid entering in, and they want to make sure everything fills correctly. Uh, mechanical uh, processes in manufacturing, uh, where they want to get optimal flow through pipes. Uh, sport, bobsleighs, for example, uh, aerospace is an obvious one, uh, chemical plants, you name it, fluid, uh, pretty much there's an application for, for CFD in it. Um, reason why there's an application are four sort of pillars of why people use it. First one is optimization. Um, the big benefit of CFD is you get to test your model um, uh, virtually before you actually build it. Uh, and then refine the model to make sure you get the uh, solution that you want to get, um, the optimal solution, shall we say. 
Uh, this reduces cost, obviously, because you don't have to actually build the physical models and test them in expensive uh, uh, wind tunnels or, or any other physical means of testing. Um, another use of it is actually safety. Um, there are many instances where it's actually too dangerous to, to set up the case if you, for example, um, uh, contaminant dispersion um, of uh, ammonia leakages or something like that, actually testing that with the correct molecular weight of the gas so it spreads accurately and, and whatnot is not really possible in, in real life. So we use CFD for those sort of situations. And then finally, there are many, many industries in growing by the day that they're required CFD test uh, chips on buildings for fire escape um, and people are having to use CFD to prove their designs are um, are safe uh, and meet the, the standards. Um, it's just a, a very brief slide on so you have an idea of how CFD works. Uh, it solves conservation equations. Now effectively what this means is Massa enters a system, so the amount of air, let's say, that enters a system is equal to the uh, mass that exits the system. There's always a balance. Um, what we then do is we take this over and we discretize it. So we, what we say is we take the a domain, uh, so the green box would be the area that we're analyzing, um, and the mass into the green box has to be the same as the mass going out. And then what we do is we chop that down into a bunch of smaller and then apply the exact same principle. So the mass into every one of the little blue squares uh, is the same as the mass going out. And that's effectively what we do. The, the equations that govern that are complex, but the principle is quite simple. Uh, the next point is turbulence. Now, this is one of the most complicated parts of, uh, of CFD. Um, obviously, we know what turbulence sort of looks like. Um, it's, it's a sort of funny uh, vortices that you get behind things. There are two ways of dealing with it. You can actually apply a model uh, such as, that's what Reynolds Average, average Navier-Stokes RANS uh, does. Uh, this doesn't model the turbulence, it doesn't solve the turbulence explicitly, so we're not exactly analyzing how the, uh, the air twists at these very small scales. We apply a model, and there are different models depending on what you're interested in. Some are more applicable than others for particular uh, cases. But this is a very economical way of, of solving this issue uh, and it gives us run times that can you know, be down to minutes or, or hours where otherwise it probably wouldn't be possible. There are, so, however, some cases where we really want to see the fine detail uh, and for this we have large eddy simulation and this actually resolves some of this detail flow uh, at the very small scales. Um, the downside is it's a lot more expensive computationally to run, so it, you know wrong, longer run times. You need finer grids and and whatnot. Um, Rhino Safety actually has both these incorporated, so you can always pick and choose which one you want to use according to what your um, necessity is. Um, a little bit onto the product. I mean, it's it's a fully integrated setup within Rhino. Um, our aim was to take our other main software upon which is based, Phoenix, and uh, allow Rhino use use it um, without the learning curve that you get from, from using a new uh, bit of software. Phoenix itself actually ha is was the very first commercial CFD code ever produced some 40 years ago. It's a general purpose CFD code, both Rhino CFD and Phoenix are, which means that anything you dream up you should be able to solve within Rhino CFD. Um, that said, we also have the specific variants. Now, the idea of this is you can uh, have only one main application that you're interested in, say buildings or say boats or say, uh, as I mentioned before, jewelry. Um, so what, we do, what we've done is we've created some special variants that help um, users set up cases that they're actually interested in. In this case, the ones mentioned here are Flare, which is our built environment one, so for architects and, and the likes. Uh, what one actually simulates uh, steam condensers, that's a very specific application, but it's a big industry as well. And we hope to soon have a, a marine variant over the next couple months as well. Um, some key abilities of, of the software, we have real parallel processing, so parallel for, for the cases where you need a lot more resolution, a lot more cells. Uh, it's a Cartesian and polar meshes that we use, so very easy to set up. Um, I'll get into this a in a second. The parcel cut cell geometry means that 
although our cells are effectively squares or rectangles, uh, we can detect what part of the cell is fluid and which is liquid, um, fluid or solid, which means that it's very easy to set up a case where you don't have to spend hours setting up a CFD mesh, which a lot of softwares do. Um, it, we have numerous turbulence models, including the RANS and LAS options I mentioned before. Post-processing is fully built in. Um, there's in-program and online help, and relation of data input, I'll get to in a second, effectively means that is typing in a simple line or co of code or two, uh, you can get very, very complex um, conditions to be simulated with relative ease. Um, moving on to the meshing, it's, it's one of the the key points of Rhino CFD, I think. Um, here we can see a, a, an urban case this is actually downtown Singapore. Um, and we can see that the, the domain is divided into these squares. Um, so it's very easy to set up. This is uh, automatically created for us. And I'll get into uh, a second and how that actually works. Um, exactly right now. So what we're seeing here is the blue area is um, in this case, it's air. The gray area is actually a building. It's been wireframed. And here along the bottom edge of the building, we can see that it's curved and intersects these, um, these cells. And you can see that it's accurately uh, picked up what part of the cell is fluid and what part is solid, which means that when you're trying to define, oh, is this mesh going to pick up my geometry? Is it too complex or not? In general, we should be able to pick it up very accurately uh, because of, the, of this inbuilt algorithm, which saves the user, obviously, a lot of time. Um, Another aspect is regions. So sometimes you want to say, well, I want more mesh to be concentrated in the area where I actually want it. So the orange lines define regions. They're created automatically. You can also create extra ones if you want. Um, but I can then say, well, in this region right here, the second one, I want to add in double amount of cells. So you can control that quite easily. Uh, and I'll show you how in, in a second in, in the demo. Um, and obviously, auto meshing as well. We have an algorithm that automatically decides what the best cell distribution is, or it poses one. You can then refine, change it as you see fit. Very good starting point. Uh, so you can start getting uh, running cases within minutes. Um, moving on to that relational data input that I mentioned before, uh, INFORM is what we call it, it stands for input formulae. Um, you no need to recompile code, so a lot of codes you have to, when you input your own formula, you have to recompile the whole thing. No need for that here. Um, and it can be used for all sorts of things. So we can set sources, so I can say I want uh, this window here to blow in air at a certain speed. Um, I can set initial values in the domain. Um, I can cal calculate new quantities, so say I want to calculate how many parts per million of a specific contaminant are coming in. Well, that's not a default option, but with one line of code, I can set that up. Um, you can calculate average values, uh, print them. It, it effectively allows the sort of thing that you could have when, when programming your own code. Um, you can actually do that right in here. Um, and in a much simpler fashion, in fact, just to get you an example on that. So if I want to set the velocity of an object, a fan, uh, to 20 meters per second, when a temperature at a specific location exceeds 60 degrees, and you think about it, that's quite complex because you have to monitor that location. You have to know what the fan is, where it is, and, and how to set this up. In fact, that's one line of code. So I can say the source of V1, which is effectively um, velocity in the Y direction, uh, at fan, so at a specific object that's called fan, is 20, because that's what I want it to set it at, meters per second, um, with a condition, temperature, tem1 is temperature, uh, at a specific location is greater than 60. Done. Uh, so in your, in this case, it would probably be a transient simulation, more than likely it's a time-dependent one. Um, that one line of code will make sure that at a, when that condition is set, something automatically activates, and this fan will start blowing uh, at 20 meters per second. Um, just moving on to Flare a bit, which is uh, one of our main variants, again, for the for the built environment users. Um, it has a lot of default sets that are optimized for these sort of cases, several extra object types, like a fire object and, and its associated attributes that you can modify very easy without having to code your own um, values in. And it has a lot of um, related modules as well. 
um, thing you can do with it. So you can obviously monitor temperature distributions, fire growths, radiation, humidity, comfort indices are, are quite uh, a big thing with many people who are um, uh, working in this area. So apparent temperature, uh, draft rating, wet bulb temperature, it takes account into humidity and stuff like that. Um, also smoke layering, age of air. Uh, so how long, how old is the air uh, in your building? Um, is it actually being refreshed enough? Um, are people going to sort of suffocate or feel really stuffy and, and smelly? That all that we can we can pick up, and obviously a few other things I've mentioned in, in the slides. Um, one other thing that's actually quite useful is um, obviously buildings tend to be surrounded by trees and other types of plants. Um, in particular, when you have forests, that really alters the way the air behaves around it. So if you don't take these into account, um, it can really give you a misconception of, of what you think um, the air is, uh, the wind's going to be doing in these areas. Um, now, individual, obviously modeling individual trees is going to be very expensive to uh, to pick up, you know, the, the structure of a tree. So what we've done is we've taken a space average approach. We can model what area we want to be a forest, for example, and say what type of tree types we have, you know, how many roughly, how densely populated is it? And this automatically is taken into account in the wind calculations. And we, we can see in these two here is um, the turbulence comes off of the, the canopy and the pressure uh, and how this is affected by uh, having a dense area of, um, of trees uh, around your buildings. Uh, we also have solar radiation. So sun will obviously heat up the buildings um, in some areas, some not, depending on whether there are shadows and the angle of the sun, all into account. Heated building can then create uh, updrafts and undrafts and, and really moderate Way the, the temperature and the wind behaves in these areas. So this is something we have a model that's already inbuilt to, to handle these sort of things. Um, and actually, well, coming soon, I suppose I can do this now, why not? Um, we expect hopefully full integration with Grasshopper and, and Rhino X uh, when that comes out. Close the end of the year, that's, that's the rumor. Uh, we're looking forward to introducing Rhino Marine, which will have, a, again, a specialized interface and, and do things like wave propagation and propeller shape testing and soon be uh, rigid body dynamics. So we'll have, uh, as opposed to just having a, a static boat and flow for, flowing past it, we'll actually make, be able to make that boat react um, and uh, float and move up and down according to uh, the hydrodynamics of the case. We'll have also improved free surface modeling, which again is used for the marine industry and also for the likes of um, metal casting and, and stuff like that. Uh, DES, which is an, a ref it's when I mentioned turbulence before, uh, LES and RANS, this is a sort of step in between. So you'll be able to make more accurate or have more accurate uh, representation of turbulence without the computational expense. And then other things like integration with um, with other bits of software, uh, in particular Rhino plugins such as Caramba, the FEA structural analysis one, um, which we hope will allow users to uh, be able to combine the two and have their loadings on their buildings, for example, uh, the exact loading that we calculate in Rhino CFD, you can then apply to your build building and see how it reacts under those conditions. Um, I do have one more slide, but I'll get to that uh, probably at the end. Let me just swap over to the actual um, plugin itself. Here we are. Um, so as we can see, this is a normal Rhino window. What I'm going to do is to set up a very simple case here to show you what it's like. Uh, in this case, it's going to be so simple as just flow past a box. So here we have a simple box. Um, what I'm going to do is then activate Rhino CFD. So I pick where I want uh, the simulation to run. Uh, I have a folder here called test, which is perfect. Um, the first window allows me to pick whether I want core or any other cores or normal Rhino CFD. We can also choose flare uh, if we're doing uh, a built environment case. In this case, core is fine. And we can see that a domain has been created around our uh, our box. So what we're solving for the, all the equations and all is inside this box. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the gumball and I'm going to make it just a little bit bigger uh, in every direction. So it's, we can see it's, it's quite easy to manipulate. Um, 
except uh, there we go. Um, and then way, what I'll do now is I'll walk through these, these buttons, the toolbar. Um, and what I want to sort of emphasize this point is you should be able to set up a case by simply clicking in order from left to right all the way through. Before the double breaker is all our pre-processing buttons and after that are the post-processing buttons, so the viewing of, of results. Um, this first button here uh, opens our main menu. So here we can see our main menu. And again, the principle holds where if you go through all these um, from left to right, chances are you're, you're gonna set up a good case. Um, models, uh, oh, let's start with geometry. Um, in this case, it's steady. So we don't want, we don't, it's not, nothing is going to be changing in time. For example, you could have a, a, an inflow rate of velocity that changed with time. We could change that here, but that's fine. Uh, this is where we change the, the, the grid side uh, and we, well, it's set to automatic or we can modify that by clicking here and, and modifying this. Automatic's fine now. Uh, once we're in models here, this is the what physical models are we actually modeling? So we can choose as free surface models, which is used for boats, uh, energy equation, for example, if you want to solve for temperature, uh, what turbulence model you want to use, KHN is pretty standard and very good. Uh, if you want to solve for radiation, combustion, and a few other other options. Uh, properties refers to what fluid we want to use, at least set to air, it's a default, but you can change that to water or pretty much other thing you can think of. For example, if we change it to liquids, well, there's uh, ethylene, freon, glycerin, mercury. Um, there are a lot of inbuilt standards, so it makes things easy without having to code yourself. And the defaults are set up for the most usual ones, namely air. Um, we can change a few of the properties of it as well. In this refers to are the values in the domain before the simulation starts. So in this case, it doesn't matter. We can initialize it at effectively zero and the solution will get end. If we're running a time dependent case, it's normally important to set what these initial values are because that is the actual conditions in the room or whatever modeling at time one, uh, in fact, at time zero. Um, but again, in this sort of case, we don't have to touch anything. Uh, sources refers to mostly where you're going to find here is gravitational forces. So if you're solving for temperature, you want gravity turned on because you want hot air to rise and cold air to drop, for example. Um, we can also solve for rotating coordinate systems and a few other odds and ends. Um, there's a lot of, uh, because it's a general purpose so software, there are a lot of options. But in general, you shouldn't have to touch much if you just want a simple case. Um, numerics, so that starts a little slightly more complicated side of CFD. Now, the way CFD works, it's, uh, it's an iterative procedure. So it effectively, the software makes a guess and then finds the error and then tries to minimize the error. So it's guessing after uh, on each iteration. Here we set how many iterations we want. A thousand is a reasonable number. Uh, we can then go to relaxation control. And this, this um, actually refers to what is it, how does the solver iterate between steps? So does it make big guesses, small guesses? Um, we can control that here. In general, small guesses is better. Um, the problem is that tends to take a little bit longer to do. So it's trying to find the balance and that unfortunately comes with a little bit of experience. That said, if I click on it, I can see that there's something called automatic convergence control, what we call Conwiz, don't really know why, uh, called Conwiz and effectively it does a lot of things for you. So you shouldn't have to play around with relaxation too much. It should do it for you. If you choose to do it on your own, and there are many cases and reasons why you'd want to, you just click off and change the values here. Um, and then these are limits on variables, difference in schemes, iteration control. There are options to really fine tune your simulation. Chances are you're not really ever going to need them. Um, output refers to um, the output of the, the results. So for example, field printout um, here, we can set uh, this value here and print one is every hundred of those iterations is going to dump uh, a result file uh, that you can visualize. So you can see how your solution is uh, getting to the, the converged ultimate goal um, if you want. This becomes important if you have a transient simulation, you want to set to dump every time sweep because you want to see its evolution in, in time of, of your result. Field dumping uh, refers to the actual physical written result file, which I can get to a bit later. That contains all the numerical values um, of your simulation. And in this case, it's gonna dump, um, print out every 250 steps, iterations. That is a menu, effectively. Uh, one more thing, and I'll do this now. Um, so actually, 
uh, you can do it from the main menu. You can just right click on that main button and it brings up these domain edge conditions. Now, what this means is this is my boundary conditions. Here's where I'm going to set up where flow comes in and goes out. So I know um, at low X, um, I have, I'm going to set a flow condition, set the settings to say one meter per second. And I want to set on the opposite side an opening um, and set the flow. And you, you don't have to set anything here. It's effectively a fixed pressure boundary. So it calculates what needs to go in and what needs to go out. So that's fine. Um, I can click OK. And I can see that now I now have an inlet marked with an air and the direction of the flow, which is going to flow past my cube and then out on the other side. Um, going back to the panel, um, I can actually modify the third button edits the CFD property. So I can say, okay, this, I can change its name. I can call this a, um, I can, what type of object it is. So is it a fan? Is it meant to be uh, foliage? So those, those trees I mentioned earlier, um, there are many types of objects and we have a user manual that explains all this, obviously. A blockage is effectively, well, as it sounds, blockage and I can change its attributes so I can make uh, I can make effectively the, the walls of it move so for example uh, you'd want this if you had a, a race car for example and you're racing ground you want the ground to move with you because that's effectively what's happening in in real life in the reference frame of the car uh, so we can change that in slide velocity you can also add temperature if we were solving for temperature in this case we oop, we don't need to do anything the next case is the grid. So I can actually see the grid with this um, fifth button here. I can show it. Here we can see the, the number of cells we have uh, in each region. Um, and if I rotate this, it obviously changes about. Um, the fourth one is actually I can modify that grid. So what I'm going to do here is in the X direction, I'm going to set it to manual, and I'm going to change this to 15, 15, and 8. Uh, I hit OK. And we can see how it now it's a finer mesh. Um, the following button, uh, the probe, is this little blue thing here. This refers, this is used mostly as a processing, as a convergence tool. So what we do is we pick a location where the flow is going to be vaguely uh, and we analyze what's uh, as we're finding the solution, what the solution is doing. So this helps us establish whether the, uh, the solution is converged or not. Ultimately, uh, it doesn't affect simulation where you put it, so it doesn't matter. It just gives you more control. Um, the next button adds inform, which is those functions I told you before. And finally, run solve. Now, depending on what, you, what you're doing, you for a small amount of cells, running it in serial is actually quicker because it's all on one processor. If you have a huge amount of cells, you probably want to run it in parallel uh, and spread the load over several processors. So if I click run here, here I can see the simulation. I'm just going to pause that by clicking any key. On the left-hand side, we can see the value of um, pressure and velocity and turbulence at that probe location that I mentioned earlier. On the right-hand side, I can see the percentage of error of, the, of each of these equations. Roughly what we're looking for is on this right-hand side for all these curves to go all the way to the bottom or at least be going downwards and then see the error value itself to be an, a low number. On the left-hand side, we're looking for it to just be stable in general. If I click go, um, we can see that it's a very simple simulation, uh, so it won't take long to run at all. Um, in fact, what's going to happen is all the lines are going to hit the very bottom, and it's going to automatically detect that it's reached my convergence criterion, which was set earlier, um, and it just stops the simulation. So now we have results for simulation. How do we visualize them? That's the next button on the, on the other side, load results. So I can click on it. Um, you can set what results you want to view. In this case, latest dumped files. OK. And there we are. So we have a little control panel uh, where we can plot stuff like streamlines, surfaces, gradients. I'll get to that in a second. But contours, which is the most uh, obvious thing to do, is um, controlled by this little goal. Here we can see that um, pressure is increasing at the front of the block as the air slows down and hits the block and excel it drops on the other side where the flow is accelerating around. And we can see this if we plot velocity. So we can go to current variable uh, and we can click any of the variables that you want. So you, you may be interested in the turbulence or in the density of the fluid if you have multiple fluids or um, uh, the velocity, which is a, a more obvious one. And we can see that um, it's accelerating 
along the sides. In fact, let me show you. Uh, here we have a, um, a scale for, for the values. Um, and we can see it's accelerating around the side and it's slow behind it where there's an area of, of recirculation wake. Now, it looks a little bit blocky because we haven't used very much mesh. This is the reason why we increase the number of cells we're using to get a much better resolution of these sort of areas. Um, just going on to some of these other ones we have in post-processing. So streamlines, uh, I can this probe, hopefully. Oh, no. That's not why it won't happen. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me restart this real quick. Um, apologies for that. Uh, in fact, oh, I see what's happened. <laughs> Actually, I did the very typical thing of not saving. So let me just set this up real quick. It shouldn't take about a second. Um, yeah, that's fine. And I'll just uh, recreate exactly what we did before. The domain a little bit bigger. Um, I'm going to set up these domain faces. So flow in one, open on the other side. Yep, that's fine. Uh, and we should be good to go. Run the simulation. And perfect. So hopefully, this time we can continue on with the rest of the what we're reviewing. We can load results in again. Um, let's set up some streamlines. So I want to create, add a probe for streamlines. That gives me this um, nice little bar here. Here we are. To move this backwards and this way and down a bit. And here we can see uh, streamlines pass. Let's just move this out of the way for the moment. Oops. There we are. So here we can see the streamlines. And we can edit what these streamlines look like, how they're colored. Um, I want them to be tubes, not ribbons. Um, and that's changed them there. They're not very thick. Uh, I can change how many I want of them. So I can call 40 um, and oops, there we are. Um, and I can change the length of this and that should go well. Uh, we can also do ISO surfaces, which means I can, if I add a probe here, this blob that's appeared means that it's colored every region in the domain where the value is zero for pressure, that's what it's selected. So it gives you a 3D representation where the contour gives you a 2D representation. We have line graphs as well. So this effectively exports results. It's a little bit tedious to show here, um, but exports the results along a line to a CSV file. So you can know exactly what the values are. And we can do surface plots as well. So if I hide, oops, I think I clicked on the wrong one there, but Okay. Try to delete this. There we are. And delete that. And let me bring my square back. Here we are. So one of the things I can do, and I can do this from here. I can do it from this probe, uh, this button up here in the toolbar does the exact same functions that I'm describing. If I click on uh, contour blockage, I can select it and it colors a blockage with the pressure values that I want. This is particularly useful if you're doing stuff like, um, uh, for example, you want to know the loading on your particular building, uh, or you want to know the velocity on your particular, on your boat exactly. Uh, we can find these values quite easily. And then the, the really good thing is we can then export uh, these results to a CSV. So you can manipulate them and actually use these values, um, which is actually uh, used in the refinement process. Um, that more or less covers it. Um, there are a few extra buttons up here. So this actually display, brings up this path. Uh, we have toggle, toggle the legend here, uh, add different types of probes, hide object. Uh, these same steps refers to if we have a trans case. Um, we can obviously play and pause if we have multiple time steps, create like a video. 
we can view the Q1 and result file. Now, Q1 is our, it's the main input file for Rhino CFD. It contains all the data in one file, and you can actually modify that file uh, directly. It's a simple text file. I won't bring it up. I won't bore you with that at the moment. Uh, but it does prove to be very useful um, to modify things without having to go through the interface and we can load and save cases and the final thing is just up to get a little bit of help and uh, updating your your license um, okay so that's effectively showed you the principles of it what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a few uh, cases that are a little bit more relevant uh, hopefully so let me okay I'll first bring up a, how about this one, an external flow case. So what I've done here, let me get rid of these results for the moment. Okay. Okay, there we are. And let me put that in, say, rendered. There we are. Um, so what we have here, this is actually a, a real case scenario. It's a, a small town in England called Hastings. And what the client wanted to do is this green building here in the middle. Uh, in fact, you can actually see it underneath. It used to be a smaller building, and they wanted to increase it in size. The reason they wanted to do this is, um, well, to redevelop the property. But they were interested in particular on the rooftop. They actually wanted to have a... Um, a livable rooftop, so they want to have a, a bar in some uh, some spaces there, and they want to make sure the wind velocities in these particular locations weren't going to blow people over and, and be uncomfortable. Um, so we have the geometry of the entire area set up the case. We have a wind object, which I can tell you about a little bit in a second. Um, let me go to, if I right click here, list of objects, I can find the one that's called wind. Double click on it, go to attributes. So here we have, where before I said I want flow in here and flow out there, we can also set up a wind object. So I can set what the pressures are, what the wind speed is, what direction it's coming from. Um, what it actually does is it applies an atmospheric boundary layer. That means that uh, the velocity is obviously zero or next to zero at the, at the ground level, and then it increases by logarithmic law up to whatever value. And then you, what you do is you set the, the velocity at a reference height. Um, the boundary layer that it, the, the shape of the wind uh, curve effectively is affected by what comes upstream. So you can say what comes upstream. Uh, you can have an included sky, an open sky. Uh, you can sort amplification factors as well, which um, uh, effectively monitor the value of uh, the wind velocity with respect to a reference value, in this case, which is set at 1.5. Um, so it's it's very easy or a very useful tool to be able to um, um, set up cases for these sort of uh, scenarios very easily. Um, there we are. Uh, so what I'll do now is I can show you some of the results. We'll load them in. Uh, this case, I mean, the reason I'm not running it now, this case took, I think, about... 30 minutes maybe to run. Uh, there's a lot of cells to pick up, you know, a lot of the geometry and stuff like that. Um, that's not a problem. Um, so as I'm just showing you the results of the case I ran earlier, but what we can see is velocity. So here what we're seeing is, is what I mentioned about the wind. You have high winds at the top, low at the bottom near the buildings. Um, if I want to change the angle of this, it's simple with the gumball. I simply s rotate that by 90 degrees, and we can see what uh, it's doing in any other way. I can also rotate that by 45, Oops. and I can have it at any funny angle, so that's possible as well. It's not relevant at the moment, obviously, but it could be depending on, on your case. Um, and in fact, let me try to rotate that an extra 45. And I've got a horizontal um, flow past my buildings. And what we can see here, I'm not entirely sure. In fact, let's find out. We can se select vectors so you can actually see how the wind is flowing past your um, your buildings. Um, oh, what happened? Oh, here we go. Um, so I actually want to scale my velocity slightly. So I'm going to set that down to, say, 10 that effectively changes the the scale of these um 
of these vectors. But what we can see here is the wind's coming in from one side, from the, the right-hand side. In fact, that's made it worse. Uh, probably the other way around. Let's try that, doing that 20. Um, and we can see it flowing through the buildings and, and heading and how it, uh, it's, it's going through. <laughs> I'm going to stop now because I'm clearly doing this wrong. There is this button here, a vector scale, and I can apply. Um, and that should be able to make it smaller. So if I do 0 0.5 here, um, that should make all my vectors much, much smaller. Uh, there we are. So it's a little bit more easy to see. And we can see the, the canyoning effect that you get in these sort of cases where you have high wind velocities in some areas and dead areas in others. And this is quite important normally to urban planners. The same principle can be applied, obviously, to boats, airplanes, um, you name it. Uh, this is a, a very sort of simple simulation to, to be able to run. Um, let's move on real quick to uh, from before uh, to the internal flow case. So what we have here again, let me show you some. In fact, one thing I'll show you. Uh, you'll see results here, and if I show the top view, uh, we can see that there's it's gray in these areas. That means that if I show you the mesh. What it's done, it's detected, as I mentioned before, what areas are um, inside the, the flow and which ones aren't without having to specifically spell it out. Um, but let me explain a little bit what the case is doing. Again, let me, let me give you some rendered here. So we have a simple apartment. Um, what I've done is I've assumed that this is a kitchen and this block here is actually a stove and it has a high temperature and a contaminant. In this case, let's call it a smell. Um, and I want to know in my house, uh, I have a few windows on the side. So I've got windows along the edges. You can see these these blockages here are meant to be the windows. In fact, maybe you can see in wire frame, maybe not shaded. OK. Um, I have windows around the, the house. And I want to know, OK, how is my house being cooled or heated by this stove and a few heating elements I have around um, and how far does the smell go um, and like I say in this case it's it's meant to be smell from the kitchen but it could be anything else um, let's look at sorry multiple windows opened here um, and display parameters so in fact what we're seeing here is temperature so we can see temperature is hot uh, in this case I'm limited to 30 but I can change that to say 45 um and then we, we should see a change in the plot it's running a little bit slow at the moment mm, note to self don't change the, the scale okay i'm oh, sorry about this not not really seem to have frozen oh there we are um, so we can see the temperature is hot in, in the corner and how that temperature is spreading through. We can see the, the arrows are pointing which way that wind's uh, actually coming in through these windows here. And we can see that the only way it has to go is out through the other ones. Now, what I mentioned before is this um, C1, the, the smell. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to see that now and how that spreads through the house. Um, it's it's a, it's a bit of an odd thing to to be able to do, but that's partly why I wanted to show it. I wanted to show the, the capabilities of a, of a truly multi-purpose software such as, uh, such as this one. Um, this, we've been using, we've used this for all sorts of things, smells, trackers, radiation, um, uh, pollution through tanks, uh, all sorts of stuff. It, effectively, it's just a scalar. Uh, here we can see it. And what, what we can see is um, the value goes from zero to one. But I could have added in a line of inform, which would plot this value in parts per million of air. Uh, so if it were, for example, uh, you're monitoring uh, uh, ammonia release, we could actually see how much ammonia is in each particular area. Uh, one of the things I haven't mentioned, we can export this particular plane. So this cut plane here, I said, I want to know the values at each location. All I have to do is click export results, and that exports straight to a, a CSV file, which you can open in um, Excel and analyze those results however you want. So it's not just visual. You can get all the data that you really need to optimize your designs. Um, and then finally, uh, let's show you a marine case. Let's click OK here. Um, 
what we have here is a hull. In fact, a very well-known hull. It's a DTMB four five four one five. It's a U.S. Navy um, standard ship on which they've done multiple studies. Uh, it's effectively a test a test case. So what we've done here is this is um, uh, what we call a free surface model. That means that I have two inlets in this case, one at the bottom, one at the top. The one at the bottom is blowing in uh, water, uh, as if it were the sea. The one at the top is blowing in uh, air. Um, and the blockage that I just hid is just a simple blockage that we define for the start of the simulation, what part of the simulation is air and what part's water. So this part down here is water, this part is, is air. Um, so I can hide that as well. Again, this simulation takes about 30, 40 minutes to run, roughly. Uh, so I'll just get to showing you some of the results. Um, so if we go to Rhino CFD, uh, load results. And in fact, I want to reboot. And hopefully, it's always slightly nerve wracking doing live demos and. <laughs> Never knowing exactly how if it's going to work or not, ghost in the machine and all. That's also the beauty of it, Andrew. So well, we <laughs> love it. Well, so so far it's been behaving minus that small little hitch we had. So it's, it's going well so far, I think. Fantastic. Um, what we have here now is a lot of different variables. So we have um, shear stress, which obviously in the water uh, none. Let me just turn the gumball on again. Uh, but around the boat, we will have some some stress, uh, skin friction, sorry, shear stress is a different one. Um, oops, raise it up a little bit higher. There we are. Um, it's not very visible here. Let's show velocity. So here we can see that the boat is producing a very small wake, which is effectively what we want because it's quite well streamlined. Um, but what we want to see is if I rotate this by... 90 degrees and bring it over towards the middle. In, in theory, this case would not have to be run uh, for an entire domain. It's symmetrical. So to save on mesh, what you normally do is uh, split it down the middle and only simulate half of it. Uh, but in this case, just for visualization purposes, we, we ran the full thing. Um, and if I plot the volume fraction, that will give us the uh, water, which is in red in this case and the air is in blue. And then the best way to see this is actually to set an ISO surface. So I'm going to add an ISO surface probe, which is up here somewhere around here. I'm gonna set it to one. Let's try 0 0.9. And which one is it? Ah, there we are. Um, so let me just, Delete that one. Now what we can see here is actually the bow wave of the water growing and going around it. Now this looks pretty. Uh, and this is a, a simple uh, mesh object. So we can then color this in some of our promotional material. material. You've seen rendered versions of this, which means that you can actually produce images that look good and are accurate at the same time. Um, but this is particular, particularly useful because then we can now, for example, go back to um, surface contour and surface contour of boat um, and hopefully this will appear now in a second there we are so we can actually see on the boat itself um, if I delete this we can see where the water water is reaching um, what the effect of that is and as I mentioned before aside from being able to export these values we can then use it to actually um, calculate the stresses and the friction and the forces on this boat. Um, so at the moment, the way this is set up is, like I said, it's an uh, um, it's our general interface. Um, but what we're aiming to do is greatly simplify this and make the, the boat actually react in terms of the way it, um, pitching and heaving um, in response to the water and potentially waves that may be coming, um, coming in from the inlet. Um, so that's more or less what I wanted to show you today. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left. I want to keep a, an extra few minutes to uh, to allow you to, um, to ask any questions if you have them. Um, feel free.
Yeah, and don't be don't be shy. This is it. This is when you get to ask all your questions, and um, this uh, you know, Andrew is the best person to answer you. So let's wait a few minutes. Let's see sure. if anybody um, has anything to ask. Type them in in the question tab. I don't see any, but I have I have one actually. I was I was wondering about jewelry application. Yeah. So I I don't have a case at the moment with me, but I'm pretty sure I have a simple on a previous presentation that I did. Just remember which one had it. I think it may be this one. Um, let me see if this one has it. No, this one doesn't. Um, I do. There's a so the application is it's it's filling off a off a mold uh, effectively. Let me. I don't know if. Cool. I'm That's okay. Me. You know, actually, um, come comes to think of it, um, we can have another maybe webinar all about uh, jewelry. Oh yeah, de definitely. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, we have, yeah, we have so many uh, jewelry designers that use Rhino, and I'm sure that. You know, they would love to see uh, your plugin applied. Definitely. I mean, the applications are, uh, I suppose, slightly less limited. It's mostly more down to the technical mold filling um, uh, of, of what they do. Um, but I think what, it, what we want to illustrate is the fact that we can do these things. So we want to allow, um, uh, I don't know the problems that a jeweler has. Uh, all I can do is say, look, we can do it, and I want them to come to me with their problems so we can find a way of, of solving them. I can imagine a very complex mold where, where flow is going through um, very small areas and expanding into others um, can lead to imperfect um, areas or imperfect filling, uh, and that's something that we can we can help them discover and, and optimize to make sure that what they're designing uh, or what they get at the end of the day is exactly what they're designing and not some sort of some uh, substandard uh, due to well that's, constraints in in the in the mold that's great news for all jewel jewelers out there i'm sure they'll be very interested so you know um maybe something to look forward to in the future in the meantime i don't see questions i think it was a, a very clear presentation and um what an extensive, uh, all the extensive application that you um, show today. Wow. Um, I mean, <laughs> oh, that, that's, that is just a people. small point. Uh, there, there's still many, many more things that we can do and that we're currently working on. But uh, unfortunately, time is limited. So I figured I'd, I'd take the, the slightly more relevant ones for, for Rhino users as far as we can tell. Yeah, and actually, okay, let me see. There is there is one question. Do you have an automotive? Automotive or vehicle example with ground moving under object? Um, I don't on me at the moment, um, but it's very, very simple. So um, I can just show you this with here with a boat. Um, effectively, all you would do is um, add an object. So if we go down, back to this main, oops, let me, let me go out of results. Go back to this main domain faces. I can set uh, the Z is normally the vertical direction. So I can set Z min. Uh, to a wall, I say yes, and I can change the settings to that. Uh, roughness, wall velocity, so yeah. So here we go, slide velocity. I can set that slide velocity to whatever velocity I want. Normally it's the same as the incoming wind velocity, and then it runs. And the only effect you're actually going to see in your model is actually the, um, you're not going to see the boundary layer forming because the air is going to be coming at the same speed as the as the ground. So visually, you won't see much, but you'll know that your your solution is accurate, uh, which is what you want at the end of the day. But something very simple is, like I said, just setting the, the slide velocity, and you're good to go in that case. That's very cool. Thank you, Andrew. I'm yeah. going to um, take the screen back in sure. a second and wrap up the presentation. Let me see. Um, you should be able to see my screen promptly. Okay. And I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. And uh, I would like to remind you that this is where you can find Rhino CFD on uh, the Novage website um, and also all the Rhino plugins plug product and Rhino itself. 
and uh, um, follow us on Facebook, Google Plus, Twitter. Next webinar is going to be Be Ready for Cinema 4D. Thanks again for watching us today and joining us. Thank you, um, Andrew and Ryan. And uh, this webinar recording will be uploaded um, shortly on our YouTube Vimeo channel. So you can spread the word, uh, watch it again, and um, um, you know see all Rhino CFD can do uh, for you. What are thank you, you everybody for attending. And uh, thank you, Barbara, for, for having yeah. us. Fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great rest okay. of the day or night. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.